Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on the 2023 Ontario HIV testing guidelines. My name is Jennifer Burbage. I'm a nurse consultant at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting today's session. My ancestors are from Europe, and I want to acknowledge the colonial history of Canada and the continued struggles faced by Indigenous peoples. I acknowledge that the land we are hosting this virtual education session on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I acknowledge that this territory is governed by Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to gather and work on this land. I will now mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. And I would like to state that as the moderator of this session, I have no conflicts of interest. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's presentation, Patrick O'Byrne and Dr. Austin Zygmunt. Patrick O'Byrne is a nurse practitioner with Ottawa Public Health and a full professor of nursing at the University of Ottawa. Dr. O'Byrne's clinical and research work focus on the prevention and diagnoses of sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. Dr. Austin Zygmunt is a public health physician in health protection at Public Health Ontario and a practicing family doctor in Ottawa. He completed his certification in the College of Family Physicians in 2018 and his Royal College Fellowship in Public Health and Preventive Medicine in 2021. His public health work focuses on sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, including HIV and emerging infectious disease threats such as MPOX. His public health interests include communicable diseases, health equity, and LGBTQ plus health. So I'll pass it over to Austin to get us started. Uh, so before we get started, I uh, want to note that neither Patrick or I have any disclosures for today's presentation. Uh, so I'll start today with a brief overview of HIV serological testing and HIV epidemiology in Ontario before handing it over to Patrick to discuss the new testing guidelines. And then we'll finish with a Q&A period. I'd like to thank Maya Kessler at the Ontario HIV Treatment Network and Andrea Saunders at PHO for preparing the epidemiology slides today. And here are the objectives for today's session. So number one is to identify population groups that should be tested for HIV according to the new Ontario HIV testing guidelines. Number two is to describe scenarios and conditions where it is appropriate to test and retest people for HIV. And number three is to list additional HIV prevention interventions and when to recommend them. So when an individual decides they want to have a HIV serology test, they must first see a healthcare provider who orders the test by completing a Public Health Ontario laboratory requisition, which you can see here on the right side of the screen. Uh, this requisition was updated in 2021, and it captures important information on the patient, including their demographics, the reason for test, previous test information, ethnicity, and risk factors. Uh, the individual then has their blood drawn at a clinic or a laboratory, and the result is reported back to the ordering healthcare provider. If that result is reactive or positive, it is also sent to the local medical officer of health as per the Ontario Health Protection and Promotion Act, and that is so that public health case follow-up can occur. Uh, and then in addition, through Public Health Ontario's Laboratory Enhancement Program, or the LEP, an enhanced data collection form is sent to the ordering healthcare provider. And this is to obtain more information on the individual, including their clinical presentation, uh, more detailed risk factor information, and history of any antiretroviral treatment. I do want to highlight that HIV surveillance in Ontario is based on the information that's collected on the testing requisition and on the LEP enhanced data collection form. 
So it's important for clinicians to fill out these forms as best they can, as the information ultimately helps inform policies and programs to address HIV in Ontario. Uh, and in our review of the HIV testing requisition data, some areas have high non-completion. So for example, in 2022, data was missing for the risk factor section for 80% of tests ordered, 63% for the race ethnicity section, and 77% per country of birth. We are also noticing that roughly a third of all the HIV tests that are ordered in Ontario are not using the new 2021 testing requis requisition. So a reminder to please update your um, HIV testing forms in your clinical practice if you haven't done so yet. Uh, so in the next few slides, I will present some data published by the Ontario HIV Epidemiology and Surveillance Initiative, or OEASY, and they have a number of great reports on their website, so I encourage you to check them out. Uh, so this slide shows the first, uh, uh, the rate of first-time HIV diagnoses per 100,000 population by age group for males and females in Ontario, comparing the rates between 2019 and 2020. And you can see that in 2020, the rate of first-time HIV diagnoses were higher among all age groups for males compared to females. And when we look at the highest rates in both males and females in 2020, these were in the age groups uh, between 25 and 39. This slide shows the percent of first-time HIV diagnoses by HIV exposure category in Ontario for both males and females between 2016 and 2020. Uh, HIV exposure category was reported for 70% of male diagnoses and 56% of female diagnoses. Uh, and from this, uh, between 2016 and 2020, the highest percentages of first-time HIV diagnoses in males was among the male-to-male -male sexual contact category and for females was among the heterosexual contact with an identified risk. In this slide, the percent of first time HIV diagnoses by race and ethnicity uh, is shown in Ontario for males and females between 2016 and 2020. And for race and ethnicity, this was reported for 67% of male diagnoses and 54% of female diagnoses. You can see that between 2016 to 2020, the highest percentage of first-time HIV diagnoses for males in Ontario were among white males, and for females, it was among black females. This uh, slide shows the rate of first-time HIV diagnoses per 100,000 people by health region in Ontario for males and females from 2016 to 2020. The rate of first-time diagnoses per 100,000 males was consistently highest in Toronto over this time period. And while for females, it's been higher in Toronto, Ottawa, and Northern Ontario regions. Uh, this slide is showing the proportion of AIDS cases with a concurrent HIV diagnosis between 2013 and 2022. And so these are late stage HIV diagnoses when an individual has their first positive HIV test within 90 days of their AIDS defining illness diagnosis. Uh, between 2013 and 2022, there were 682 AIDS diagnoses in Ontario, and of which 85.3% uh, had a concurrent first-time HIV diagnosis. And you can see the proportion of AIDS diagnosis that had a concurrent first-time HIV diagnosis is very high, ranging between 73.5% to 100% annually over the last 10 years. And then my final epidemiology slide this shows the proportion of first-time HIV diagnoses in Ontario that had a concurrent AIDS diagnosis between 2013 and 2022. Uh, during that time period, there were 8,006 first-time HIV diagnoses in Ontario, of which 7.3% had a concurrent AIDS diagnosis. And that proportion ranged between 5.5 to 12% annually over the past 10 years. So I'll now hand it over to Patrick to talk through the new testing guidelines. So basically, um, 2023 guidelines are really there to update uh, what we had from the 2008 um, Say Yes to Knowing. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with the older uh, document. It was sort of that orange book um, that was really from the Ministry of Health and the AIDS and Hepatitis C program talking about right, what, we sh what we should be doing. Um, so it's really just to update that. And so after a bunch of consultation, um, the creation of the clinical guidelines, um, right, we, we really came through with this. So the new guidelines, our goal is to identify acute and chronic symptoms and uh, new and older infections. 
promote routine testing among the groups with higher rates of HIV and increase status neutral linkage. The basis to this really is a lot of the epi that Austin just went through. We have, although a decrease, we have ongoing um, numbers of new HIV diagnoses. Um, as Austin laid out pretty clearly, right, these continue to be among the same groups, right? Um, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, other men who have sex with men, uh, people of African, Caribbean, or Black ethnicities, uh, people who use drugs, members of Indigenous communities. But it, it, it continues to be the same group. Um, we also have right that 7.3% of individuals who are diagnosed with AIDS concurrent to HIV. These are late delayed uh, diagnoses. And so it's really to say, right, how can we get routine testing, right, with the groups where we're seeing the higher rates? How can we get people identified more quickly? Um, how can we not miss our chronic or later infections? And then lastly, saying that we still have around 10% of people in Ontario uh, living with an undiagnosed HIV infection. And the new targets, where we used to have the 90, 90, 90, so it means like 10%, yes, we hit our 90 goal. Um, but in 2020, um, the UN AIDS uh, updated these goals to a 95, 95, 95. So our goal really now is to take that 10% of individuals who remain undiagnosed and to reduce that further down to 5%. And the new guidelines play into hoping, right, as being sort of the template for us to be able to do that. Four major changes within this. The first is that using serology. Uh, and so really what we're talking about here is serology, not the point of care tests, not the self test, but serology itself. You can confidently rule out an infection six weeks after an exposure. We historically had said 12, right? 12 weeks, and three months. It is now reduced down to ruling out infection uh, at six weeks. Also endorsed in the new guidelines is U equals U, right? Undetectable equals transmittable. An individual who is living with HIV, who is able to achieve an undetectable um, HIV viral load, um, it, right? It, there's no risk of sexual transmission uh, of the virus. And this is now endorsed and contained within the guidelines. Moving down is a tailored pretest counseling and risk assessment to an individual's needs. This um, was a bit of a change because the older guidelines really said that you had to go through all of the standard risk assessment information, provision, um, counseling, everything was required, um, right, in any time somebody presented for an HIV test. The new guidelines are really saying, right, based on the clinical situation, based on, right, the counseling, based on just the interaction with the person who comes, uh, that information should be tailored. This has nothing to do with informed consent, right, giving all of the information about testing options, whether nominal or anonymous, um, um, right, whether to do point of care or serology, all of that continues to exist. It really comes down to should intensive risk reduction um, information be given in every single instance, particularly if someone were screening right every three months as part of PrEP or just doing their routine testing every three months. It's to make sure that this fits uh, right what the individual actually needs. And lastly, rule out infection in persons with suggestive or compatible symptoms. And this is acute infections, right? I mean, the person who comes with a mononucleosis-like um, cluster of symptoms, sore throat, fever, um, flu-like symptoms, fatigue, night sweats, uh, swollen lymph nodes, right? Any of these ruling out, but then also chronic infections, um, right? Sort of a prolonged thrombocytopenia or a recurrent thrush in somebody who's not using an inhaled corticosteroid um, medication, right? It's to say, right, these, these exist. We really want to make sure that we're ruling these infections out. Um, as well. So yes, for the question to clarify, yes, these are in fact for laboratory testing, um, not for the point of care uh, or the self-tests. So the first basis when we get into the guidelines and using them is the assessments themselves have uh, come down to this, you know, I think is a snappy little thing of just a three P's. So it's the partner's practices and protection. And so this is uh, what I have here on the screen is uh, just sort of a screen capture of page 12 where it's talking about whether or not you give PEP but the 3P assessment runs through the entire document and it really comes down to partners, right? The, the person, right, who this person had any sexual contact with or shared drug equipment with, right? This partner, is there a potential that they would have transmissible uh, HIV? You can see here, right, HIV positive and viremic. So a viral load in excess of 200. Uh, and this isn't like undetectable based on our lab standard in Ontario, which is 20. This really is what the evidence shows us for the right U equals U, which is a viral load of 200. Uh, HIV positive with an unknown viral load, right? Uh, HIV status unknown and using injection drugs. So there's your partners, right? So there's the partners. Could you potentially have engaged in a sexual or drug sharing equipment with somebody with potentially transmissible HIV. Next is the practices, um, right? Is there something that occurred that not only just have a potential exposure, but a transmission could have occurred? And so the practices really get into, right? Um, anal sex, 
vaginal sex injection drug use, right? Putting in to say, okay, do we have somebody who with a uh, potentially transmissible infection? Do we have a practice where transmission could have occurred? The last P, protection, uh, would be condoms, would be PrEP, right? Um, would be right sharing drug equipment. So it really comes down to, could somebody have potentially transmissible HIV infection? Two, is there a potential right, practice where transmission could have occurred right, in the event of exposure? And lastly, were the breaks in protection, meaning that condoms uh, weren't used, a condom was used but broke, um, somebody removed the condom, um, right, anything in that card. So it's really just that three uh, P assessment that we're looking at. Overall, and this is an overwhelming sliding graphic, uh, but overall there's four prongs and we're gonna go through each one. So, and our three P assessment effectively uh, goes across all of them. So the, the red prong, which is prong number one, is really on sort of higher risk exposures. The second is for chronic infections. Uh, the third, right, is the populations with higher rates. And then the fourth is other care situations, which is going to be uh, prenatal screening, starting people on immune suppressive drugs, right, all of the, the sort of standard elements. So the first prong, the red one, is really STI clinics, um, urgent care, emergency, right, where somebody is walking in and saying there was an exposure. In case management as well, as you can see in the, the second diamond within that, the STBBI um, diagnosis or contact of an HIV case. So knowing that, as you can see with the associated STIs, infectious syphilis, rectal um, bacterial STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, gonorrhea in women, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, these become indicator conditions to say, right? Being diagnosed with one infection um, is a strong indicator uh, of a future acquisition of HIV. So it's, it's saying, let's get into our testing. The second is the chronic infections. Again, right? This is a list of things that if you were immune suppressed, we may be seen, and this would be to rule out infection. And the third is, I think one of the most common questions I get is people coming in and saying, well, how frequently should I test? It's a guy who has sex with guys. When should he be coming back? What would the recommendation be? And so that's into our third prong. So into prong one, that's that red one. Let's really pull apart all of those pieces and we'll go through each one. So who would be including high risk exposure and what what is the actual definition of a high risk exposure? It goes back to that 3P assessment. So partners, HIV positive and viremic defined as greater than 200 uh, copies of virus per mil or HIV status uh, unknown from a group with higher rates of HIV. So it's basically we're having a high risk exposure, right? There's somebody who is known to be HIV positive uh, with an, a transmissible infection or right there's just sort of the, the groups most affected and you have higher rates of um, HIV within that population. Again, right, GBT, MSM, ACB, endemic, uh, people who use drugs. Next, you need practices, right? Vaginal and or anal sex or injection drug use. And lastly, right, a gap in protection. Because if somebody comes in and says, yes, uh, I had a receptive anal sex with a partner who was newly diagnosed with HIV, but we used a condom and I'm taking PrEP and I'm using my medication, but right, you do have that protection, right? And that's where we have sort of that protection piece coming in. It's to really recognize the effect, efficacy of condoms, right? And of especially PrEP, Right, and its ability to actually uh, reduce infections. For the diagnosis, again, as I just mentioned, infectious syphilis, rectal bacterial STIs, gonorrhea among women, hepatitis B and C. Of interest here, um, a series of data have been pulled. We did one of these reviews in Ontario specifically, and we really looked at guys who have sex with guys in was Hamilton, Toronto, and Ottawa. Uh, what was the number of sort of the percentage of people who were diagnosed with HIV who had had one of these infections within the preceding three years. And for guys who had sex uh, with guys, right, who were diagnosed with syphilis, uh, gonorrhea, or chlamydia, we had 24% had within the previous three years an IFIS entry uh, for one of these infections. So really what it came down to is right, over, over a 36-month period, one out of four um, guys who have sex with guys, right, who somebody, right, a case management uh, team is dealing with, one out of four will potentially become HIV positive. And so this is where we say this is a strong indicator uh, to actually offer this testing, um, to offer PrEP and PEP, right, and we're going to move into that, but it's really to say we should be doing testing uh, right away. Uh, focuses on condom or not was the role of PrEP. Yeah, say the same for PrEP. So just with the question um, put to me on it's focusing on condoms, it's um, condom use or anything else such as PrEP and like chemoprophylaxis uh, being included within protection. 
and symptoms uh, mono-like, right? just sort of that cluster of mono symptoms. So what is the recommendation, right? What would we specifically be doing here? Uh, baseline testing, so the person comes in and tests them right away. That's within the window period, right? And the chance of this actually detecting an infection that was from a few days or a couple of weeks ago is possible, but wouldn't, wouldn't put a lot of stock in this being able to detect an infection after seven days. Uh, what is the purpose of that baseline testing? The baseline testing is for two reasons. One is some individuals, right, despite our right, best efforts to say, you know, this is when you need to come back, this is when you should repeat your testing, it just never happens. And so the baseline testing at least gives us the ability to identify historical infections. And by that, I mean infections, right, that somebody had acquired previously. Um, to give you just a little bit of an anecdote on that, so in Ottawa, starting in 2013, we, uh, we began through our STI clinic offering post-exposure prophylaxis. And what we found was a, a good number of people would actually come in, they would seek PEP, and we were having of um, GBMSM um, participants who were seeking PEP, uh, we were actually having around 8 to 10% um, di being diagnosed with HIV just through their intake assessment. So these are individuals who are coming in saying, right, I want to uh, get PEP. Uh, I'm looking to prevent an HIV right, exposure acquisition from right within the last 72 hours. But when we did the baseline testing, we found that right upwards of one in 10 were already uh, HIV positive. And so then it became less of a you need PEP and so more so of a linkage to care for the individual and any follow-up um, required around that. So the baseline gives you that historical data. Um, right? it, it gives you that initial test because if we say no, no testing today, you could miss um, all of that. Right, So we do the baseline testing. Then we move to the three-week testing. And that's really to say, right, Ontario is using the fourth generation um, architect, a very specific test that will detect both the antigen and the antibody uh, for HIV. And so it actually has a good ability to detect around three weeks. This is not going to necessarily be able to rule out, right? This is more of a ruling in part at three weeks, meaning that we can detect a number of infections, but there's still maybe 30 to 35% where it won't occur. And so consequently, we want to move to the if negative, right? That we have um, the six week test done as well. So zero and three is a rule in, and six week is our actual rule out um, for this testing. Also important here, clinically indicated STI testing. Um, just focusing on HIV testing in isolation of everything else, right, isn't sort of a best practice. If an individual is at risk for HIV, right, we also must consider gonorrhea, chlamydia, right, and in any site that was involved in sexual contact, uh, syphilis, hepatitis B, C, right, absolutely everything um, that becomes indicated. Um, PrEP, PEP, right, we want to make sure that that's included as well as harm reduction equipment in years. So this, this slide um, is not actually included in the guidelines, but all the text is. So when you get into that sort of first prong, the red section of the text, it's talking about, right, what to do, when to bring in PEP, when to bring in PrEP, um, and so forth, everything we want here. So the first question, and we're going to walk through this um, step by step, the first question is really what's the timing? Uh, the individual who is just in our polling question shows up two days before, so are they less than 72 hours? The answer is uh, yes, right? but we're actually going to go the other way because over onto the, our yes takes a little bit more work. So we're going to say no. Sexual contact the person is concerned about is 10 days ago. Consequently, right, what should we be doing? We should do our test at baseline and offer PrEP. If the individual says yes to PrEP, um, then it is the Q3 month testing. So every three months, right, we should be doing uh, our testing as clinically indicated based on our, our current Canadian uh, PrEP guidelines. If, like our polling question, the sexual contact of concern or the potential exposure was within the last 72 hours, right, then we're going to again have our test at baseline. But instead of PrEP, what we're going to offer here is PEP, so post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's going to be our 28 days of PEP that we're going to be offering to the individual. If they say no, right, then it's going to be um, a test at three and six weeks. So we're going to our standard zero, three, six week follow-up. When they show up, three weeks from the potential contact of concern, and in six weeks, which is, right, if this is within the last three days, it's going to be exact, pretty much exactly three and six weeks from when you see them. If, however, the person says, yes, PEP is something I'm interested in, you're going to test at three and six weeks, but one little caveat here is that this three and six is actually starting from the last day of PEP. So PEP is a 28-day course of medications. And they come in and they want some testing, sexual contact was within the last 72 hours, right? We initiate them on PEP, which is a month worth of medication, four weeks. And then what we're going to do is from the end of the fourth week of medication, right? That's when we're actually gonna start our clock for the three and six week follow-up. 
The rationale for this is, what do HIV medications do? They suppress viral load. What is it that actually causes antibodies to develop? Right? It is the virus level. So if an individual takes PEP and we suppress the virus level for four weeks, what we theoretically are doing is actually delaying out the seroconversion response by the four weeks that they're on it or PEP to fail. And so what we're doing is we're saying the three and six weeks is established on people who are not taking antiretroviral medications as part of PEP, right? It is on individuals right, where there are no such medications in their body. So it's three and six weeks from the moment that we discontinue the medication. At the end, right, of this, right, at the end of the PEP, so now we're going back to, right, it's the 29th day. So they've said yes to PEP, right? We would do our testing at three and six weeks. We then say, now that you're ending PEP, let's transition you immediately to PrEP. So on day 29, let's do a, a PEP to PrEP, meaning that we're going to start you from right, basically one chemo prophylaxis and seamlessly tailor it into the next one. If they say yes, we continue with our PrEP guidelines. Uh, and if they say no, then it moves into right, our two, three month testing. and We just move along. So it really comes down to, right, was the sexual contact eligible for PEP? If yes, offer it. If the person says yes, let's initiate them. Let's do our testing at three and six weeks from the end of PEP. At the end of their PEP though, what we really want instead is that we seamlessly transition this individual to PrEP and we have them continue along with PrEP and then they, they transition over to our PrEP guidelines and continue along with that. If the individual says no to PEP, then it is just our right zero, three, six month testing. So when they show up at baseline, that's our zero three weeks from the sexual contact or um, sort of drug sharing contact of concern, and then repeat at six weeks. If the individual is outside of the 72 hours, then it is really just offering PrEP um, and doing our three, six testing. And hopefully right, if the individual uh, accepts PrEP that we move it along uh, in that way. So PrEP, there are a bunch of questions um, that people have uh, put to me before about PrEP and are the HIV testing guidelines or not PrEP guidelines? Those do exist. Um, there are the Canadian guidelines, Right, and this is uh, the guidelines we developed uh, with Daryl Tan and Mark Hull. And so a team of us came together back in 2016 and published these in 2017. We are in the process of updating them. Uh, we were releasing some of the data at CAR, so the Canadian Association of HIV Researchers, um, just uh, a few weeks ago in Quebec City, so that we are in the process of updating these guidelines. We also have um, a PrepRN guideline, and I put this here because one thing that's missing from almost all um, sort of PrEP guidelines is you may be very good uh, at understanding sexual health. You may be very good at STIs, at HIV testing and follow-up, but it may have been some years uh, since you've done sort of creatinine monitoring, so kidney function monitoring. So there is a, um, in Ottawa, effectively what we do is we have a nurse-led PrEP clinic called PrepRN, and we, we've created a pathway, and that's sort of the screen capture that's on the, the um, on the slide just on the right side saying like what would you expect to be normal follow-up um, and normal parameters for following up and at what frequency if you do see abnormalities would you want to repeat testing and so this is really a, a published pathway that supplements the guidelines to say right prep is simple right prescribing it um, is a very simple safe drug following people at the one month and every three months thereafter is simple doing all the sti testing if you work in an SDI uh, clinic, this is your bread and butter, but it may have been some time or potentially if ever, that you may not have followed kidney function test results before. So we do have pathways that are published as well that supplement that to say, right, here's how you can actually uh, include this as well. Prong two, so that's all part of the prong one part, right, which is the individual who's diagnosed with an STI or is an HIV contact or comes in uh, with a potential high risk exposure and we do our 3P assessment. Next is the chronic infection. So this is, when we're looking at the data that Austin had presented to us, this is really, um, right, that the individuals who are diagnosed later, this is the individuals who may have progressed uh, to AIDS right by the time uh, they're actually diagnosed with HIV. And knowing that that timeline can be five, eight, 10 years, meaning these are quite prolonged delayed diagnoses. We also, in reviewing these um, through Ottawa that we did a couple years ago, we found that the vast majority of these diagnoses were actually done by specialists. And to see a specialist, what I mean, working in a healthcare system and having a healthcare system that has a gatekeeper component to it, your entry into the healthcare system occurs often through right, primary care or a walk-in clinic uh, or emergency. And so what occurred with the individuals with these symptoms is they did see somebody, right? A frontline service provider, a primary care provider, the nurse practitioner, their physician, uh, somebody emerged. 
who said, I don't know what your symptoms are, um, and then referred to a specialist who ran an HIV test and, and found out that the infection was HIV. So these are neither um, right people who happen to access the healthcare system, uh, nor right are they individuals who right have brand new infections. They're, they're, they're longer and um, just more drawn out. And so really what we're looking at here is reviewing um, the evidence, the literature, and what we see in Ontario is what are these symptoms right that we'd want to say right actually do HIV testing. So tuberculosis being one, anything that is an AIDS defining condition also becomes important. And then the symptoms, right, the ones that we really want to say for these chronic indicator conditions, uh, unexplained weight loss, unexplained thrombocytopenia or leukopenia for four or more weeks, uh, infectious endocarditis, particularly if somebody has a history of injection drug use, uh, shingles if under 55 years old, and then recurrent or chronic in any of the following, right, oral or vaginal um, yeast infections, skin lesions that are unusual, atypical, recurrent, uh, lymphadenopathy, so swollen lymph nodes, whether in isolation or at discontinuous sites, uh, and then pneumonias, um, 15 to 54 years old. With this, it's just a single HIV test. So the 036 is not indicated here. And the reason for it is you, if, if these are right sort of chronic infections, uh, you are well outside the six week window. So we've already passed um, that more recent um, exposure potential. Now, if somebody is coming in with these symptoms, right, and also fulfills the indications of prong ones, right, so the, the zone going high risk exposures, then you're moving back into that uh, three and six week and then hopefully moving to every three months thereafter. But this is right if there's sort of no ongoing risk, they don't meet the 3P assessment, but these symptoms do exist. Um, it's really to say, right, let's get that one HIV test um, done at one point. The third, and this is, as I said, as we went through that big, big slide that had all of the images on it of all the prongs at once. Routine testing. And so this is right, something I'm asked frequently, frequently, frequently. Uh, it's a guy who has sex with guys. It's a person who uses injection drugs. And they say, well, how frequently should I te be testing? When should I come back? Right? What, what's an appropriate um, timeline for me to be repeating all of my testing? And so these groups, right, where we have the higher rates of HIV, I've said them earlier, I'll just repeat them here. A, bisexual and other men who have sex with men, uh, people of African, Caribbean or black ethnicities, members of indigenous communities, people who use drugs, um, and cis and trans women as well, including from any of the communities right, that are listed above, uh, particularly if they're facing some sort of systemic um, or social inequity or discrimination or issues, uh, accessing care or any of these that would put them at potentially higher risk for HIV. So in the groups here, uh, really what you want is to, to stratify the individual using the three P assessment, right? Our person practices protection, our partners practices protection, uh, and then just really stratify the individual into a high or sort of a low, no, or higher risk. And then it really comes down to if there is ongoing substantial risk, right, that we test every three months. Uh, if there's a lower risk, it's still to recommend an annual HIV test. An individual says no, and they have one partner, we always use condoms. Uh, individuals don't always know. Um, and this is particularly probably more evident um, we've seen within women. Uh, we may not know what's going on, right, what the partners are doing. And so in these cases, it becomes important just to say an annual HIV test would be recommended for you. And then if the individual has zero risks whatsoever, right, the no testing becomes indicated. So drawing into sort of that little pathway, um, member of a group with the higher rates of HIV, those that were just mentioned on the slide, assess risk, do your three P assessment, right? Partners, practices, and protection. And if there's no risk, no testing is indicated. If there is low risk, right? So and that going back to the slide earlier, and this is page 12 of the guidelines, right? They come into the middle, right? This would be a low risk. And so we have every 12 month or annual testing recommended. And if the individual, according to the 3P assessment, comes in as a higher risk, substantial risk, right, then we're going to say, right, you test and you test every, you repeat the testing every three months. And remembering as well to offer PEP and to offer PrEP uh, in all of these instances as well. Lastly, the other care scenarios. Nothing that's actually listed in this prong four is new. Um, working in primary care myself, right? And if I were to initiate somebody on methotrexate, um, right, to do uh, TB drugs, um, anything like that, we're effectively right, supposed to be doing our HIV screening. What this does is it just consolidates everything into the HIV testing guidelines. So this was standard of practice, standard of care for right, the, our immune suppressing medications. And also for the antenatal record, right, um, that anyone in primary care should be using. 
to say, yes, this is the testing that you want. So there's, there's actually nothing new in this fourth prong, uh, other than the fact that it has been included um, into the actual HIV testing guidelines to really consolidate everything into one single spot. Now, there is also at the top of this um, sort of the full pathway, right, the image that's there, uh, there's a little, it says, does your patient need HIV testing? And there's a little footnote, right? There's a, there's a one that's in the superscript right at the end. And really what it says is if you go down to the bullet and it's sort of quite small text in the middle, it says behaviors associated with HIV infection are often stigmatized. If a person requests testing, testing is appropriate. If the person is a frequent tester with no evidence of risk, offer support and referral in accordance to the counseling guidelines uh, for clients with high HIV anxiety and low, no risk. This is a little bit of a change where it's, it's saying anyone who comes in requesting an HIV test, um, it is clinically indicated to do that for them once. Right? This is um, something that's actually uh, appropriate. And if the individual keeps coming back and saying they want testing, but there is no identified risk, it's to really explore that a little bit more. But the change here is right, the first time somebody comes in and requests their first HIV test, Ever, absolutely ever, right? It's to actually go and do this to say, you know what, Let, let's do this testing for you. Uh, we want to make sure you get your single test, then explore thereafter. And the main point to this is, right, um, same sex sexual contact, and injection drug use, right? any of these practices are, are, are stigmatized. They continue, unfortunately, they continue to be stigmatized within our societies. Um, unfortunately, it continues to be something that people be reluctant or have experienced stigmatization or discrimination, um, revealing and disclosing in healthcare settings before. So people may be reluctant um, to do that. So really uh, what we're looking for here is just to say, right, the individual who comes in, do that one test, um, do the one test now. So into a summary, let's take a look at um, sort of wrapping all of that together. So the context, 11% of persons uh, remain undiagnosed in Ontario. Uh, so it's we, we effectively hit the 90, 90, 90 targets, right? So the 90% of people diagnosed, 90% on treatment, 90% um, achieving viral suppression. Uh, we're pretty close to that, but the targets have increased. So you can see on my last bullet to 95, 95, 95. So the new uh, United Nation AIDS targets are for 5% uh, of people to remain undiagnosed. So we have a little bit more work to do and hopefully routine screening right, within the groups with higher rates of HIV. Hopefully, right, better detection of chronic infections, uh, really, really testing when those chronic uh, indicator conditions emerge. Um, testing at our 036 intervals, right? Offering PEP, offering PrEP, integrating this into our testing uh, for HIV pathways and protocols. Hopefully this will, right, really get us to this. Um, ongoing infections within the same groups. So despite um, bringing down sort of the number of new HIV diagnoses, it does continue to be the same groups. Uh, gay men, right, black women, uh, members of indigenous communities continue to have the burden of these infections. So it is to both promote testing, right, appropriate and ongoing and frequent testing, um, right, within these groups, but also offering, right, the interventions we know that work, right, making sure people are aware of PEP and how to access it and when to access it, making sure that when somebody comes in and they are within that 72-hour window, um, they're requesting testing that we do offer PEP, right, because potentially um, the individual, right, will be diagnosed based on the test. Potentially they're going to test negative, but there was a recent exposure, and so PEP is actually going Going to uh, prevent right, them from becoming HIV positive. And potentially this will be right, the link that brings them into using pre-exposure prophylaxis. And we can actually help the person um, maintain their HIV negative status. Ongoing delayed diagnosis, people uh, continue to be diagnosed with AIDS in Ontario. Uh, lots of people I've heard when I talk about AIDS being something that shouldn't exist uh, within a healthcare system in a context such as Ontario, and then that is perfectly correct. Uh, but we do continue to see this at around 7.3% of our HIV diagnoses over the last 10 years. So it's important um, that we can that we really make these efforts to say, how do we get people diagnosed earlier? And again, looking at the data, these are not people who aren't accessing the healthcare system. So it's really to say, how can the healthcare system, how can healthcare providers themselves include HIV as a differential diagnosis when people come in with symptoms that are suggestive, symptoms that are uh, compatible uh, with HIV seroconversion? And rashes, for example, right, are mono-like symptoms. Will many of these be HIV? Absolutely not, but some of them will be. And so that's really where we want to say, we're not saying that anytime somebody shows up with a lymphadenopathy or with a rash or with night sweats, that this is going to be HIV. 
but clinically you can't say that it isn't. And so an appropriate differential diagnosis becomes HIV and ruling out HIV becomes a very actual simple uh, test uh, to do that would be exceptionally benefit, beneficial for the individual's health. And then lastly, it's sort of our updated testing technology. So, right, using the fourth generation antigen antibody tests, uh, we now have the ability to test, right, earlier. Um, we have the ability to test more often. And so that becomes sort of a takeaway. Test early, test often, uh, following the 036 um, guideline for serology. People had asked, I saw the question was put in the chat as well, is this about point of care? To reiterate, no, if you are doing point of care testing, it still becomes the 0363. You still need the three month test, right? That 12 week test, uh, due to the fact that the point of care or the HIV self test from either if somebody's using, they are both third generation technology. So it's not using the more advanced technology that we have in the lab. Retesting timelines, when should people come back? How frequently should they come in? Uh, it's moving from never, if there's no risk whatsoever, to anybody who is in a group with uh, higher rates of HIV annually, right, if the risk is low, uh, to every three months, right, if that risk is slightly higher. And lastly, and where I think uh, we'll really potentially be able to make an impact uh, and have an effect on sort of HIV transmission um, in Ontario is this status neutral linkage. And by status neutral, we mean irrespective of the test result, whether it is positive or negative, right, that we actually have an intervention to offer people. And we do. This didn't exist in 2008 when the say yes to knowing when the previous guideline came out. We didn't have PrEP, right? If somebody tested positive, we were going to refer them for care. And if they tested negative, we we're going to talk about, right, condoms and harm reduction equipment and when they should retest. But we do have an exceptionally powerful intervention now, and that is PrEP, right? And so being able to link people to that for information or service provision, for direct initiation, if possible, right? This all uh, is definitely something that can exist. And so the new guidelines do really recommend that no matter what the result is, we have an intervention. We have counseling, we have resources, we have interventions, uh, we have chemo prophylaxis, or we have treatment, right? These, these exist um, for absolutely everyone in all of these cases. So with that, it sums up all of the slides that we have. Um, thank you for listening. I'm gonna pass this uh, to Jennifer now. Great. All right. Thank you, Patrick and Austin. So we will now move on to the Q&A segment of this event to address some of the questions from our audience. A quick note to our attendees, please continue to enter your questions into the Q&A pod if you've not already had an opportunity to do so. Uh, we've had a few questions related to the epidemiology, so I'll just start with those for Austin. And one was more or less acknowledging the poor completion of the lab requisitions where where this data is from. Uh, so asking, is this data representative? And do you think that the rate on race and ethnicity is underreported in any of these groups? Thanks, Jen. Uh, and so we have two types of forms that we went through today. One was the testing requisition form itself, and the other is an enhanced data collection form that's sent to healthcare providers when uh, their patient tests positive for HIV. So when we look at the general testing requisition form, uh, that is the form that's not uh, completed as well. Uh, we tend to get basic demographic information on patients, but things like the reason for test is, is not um, as well completed as I noted. Um, and you can imagine with the number of tests that are done for HIV in Ontario every year. So in 2020, it's roughly uh, 488,000 non-prenatal tests. The vast majority of those are gonna be negative HIV tests. So um, the information we have is just on what clinicians are filling in for their patients when they order the test for those negative tests. In terms of the, the positive HIV tests, um, PHO staff do follow up with ordering clinicians to get that, that form completed. So that one um, has a higher completion rate. So the data is more, more representative. Great. And um, is there any data describing uh, more details about the populations that make up the 7.3% of new HIV diagnoses um, that result in AIDS, uh, particularly around race and ethnicity among those? Yeah, so the data we presented today on uh, individuals with a concurrent HIV and AIDS diagnosis is new data that we're presenting for the first time uh, here today. And so we've only done a, a very basic analysis so far. You saw numbers and proportions. 
Uh, so we're going to take that back and look into doing some further analysis, such as by uh, age and sex and location, for example. So um, we'll get back to you on, on that in the future. Great. Thank you. And OK, so let's move on to some of the questions more related to the testing guidelines. So I um, there was a question about uh, sexual violence and if there were any consultation regarding populations and, and recommendations, testing recommendations following a sexual assault, either isolated or serial assaults. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, there, there were consultations done with a variety of different groups. Um, the, the point that's raised for sexual assault is a little bit unique, um, and I'm not saying unique in that it's not a frequent occurrence, unfortunately. I'm saying that, though, that there are pretty detailed uh, sexual assault guidelines on the testing that should occur, uh, what should be right, considered and taken part, and how specimen collection and follow-up uh, and everything should be done. So ideally, uh, in that case, it's the sexual assault guidelines that are followed. Embedded in that question as well is what if um, somebody doesn't know the actual risk of their partners. Um, this is explicitly written into the guidelines, which I'm right, many people don't know. And so that's where that sort of routine annual screening, or a little bit more frequently, if somebody comes in and asks for testing, again, recognizing the stigmatized nature um, of certain practices, to say, right, there should be routine screening that occurs um, in particular groups. And it's really due to that exact um, fact that many people don't know the risk factors of their partners. And so, yes, there was consultation done that is listed in the guidelines, um, and that's sort of where in the prongs it falls in. Great. Uh, so there are a few questions around um, PEP and PrEP, so I'll try and uh, go through all of those together. So one of the questions was asking about the validity of um, HIV testing while on um, I'm not 100% sure if they're asking for PrEP or, or PEP, but um, can you comment on the validity of HIV testing while on PrEP or PEP? So for PEP, um, the validity is theoretical, um, and that is why the 036 testing is supposed to be three and six weeks from the completion of PEP. Um, it should work, uh, theoretically, though, uh, because we don't actually know. It, it could delay it by a month. And so really what it is, is you start your 3-6 uh, testing timeline from when the individual completes PEP. For PrEP, the fourth generation testing does work. In fact, every piece of evidence and study that was really done, uh, particularly more recently um, on PrEP, is all using the fourth generation antigen antibody tests. And so, yes, we know that for PrEP, uh, it works exceptionally well. Great. And there's also a question about uh, if there's a risk for antiviral resistance for when initiating PrEP for high-risk exposures beyond 72 hours uh, with potential zero conversion from this exposure. There is a risk. It's exceptionally small. Um, that is, you could go into, and this, this is outside of the HIV testing guidelines, but for the PrEP guidelines, this is why we recommended the follow-up testing at four weeks. That risk, though, is low. And if we take you take a look, for example, I said the guys uh, who have sex with guys that within 36 months, one in four of them had effectively uh, right, had an IFAS encounter, meaning they had been diagnosed with syphilis or gonorrhea or chlamydia. Uh, your risk of viral um, mutations is minuscule. It's under 1%. So what we're really benchmarking there is if we have a risk of around 25% for potential HIV acquisition and a risk of maybe 0.01% for viral mutations, it's which one are we actually dealing with is a higher risk. Uh, prescribing is never risk-free. Healthcare is not risk-free, right? It's balancing the risks and benefits. And so in that case, this is where we say, no, PrEP is in fact safe and like, the option that we want. The second piece to it, though, is this is why we do our follow-up uh, so frequently. And that's why it says, right, repeat at three and six um, weeks to really make sure that we're getting all of this testing done. That if it does occur, we identify rapidly. Great. And a question about for an individual who's at ongoing risk for HIV exposure but not um, willing to start PrEP, would you recommend routine testing now every six weeks with the updated window period um, with continued PrEP counseling at, at future follow-up visits? So if this is somebody who belongs to a group you know, with higher rates of HIV, it becomes every three months, right? And that's what we have in the guidelines where if you are doing it, uh, quarterly blood testing for HIV becomes the recommendation. Now, if these are 
intermittent spaced out exposures, then you can follow your 036. Uh, but if this is ongoing um, exposures, right, it would be just a switch to every 12 weeks. Great. And a few other questions about uh, PEP or initiation. So are PEP or PrEP available? Are they OHIP covered? Um, some clinicians are unsure how to order and, and where in Ottawa specifically do we refer clients for PEP or PrEP? <laughs> so OHIP doesn't cover any medications. It covers uh, medically indicated services for insured persons. Um, some drug plans will cover uh, PEP and PrEP, so private insurance will for sure. Um, the drug formularies, OHIP Plus, for example, um, ODSP, these will cover both of the medications. There is also, um, for those of you who are less familiar, there is the PrEP Start uh, service. So just go to OntarioPrep.ca. Uh, um, there is actually a three-month uh, starter program that's available right, where anyone in Ontario can uh, fill out a prescription. This is going to have to be a licensed prescriber, and they can get the first three months uh, covered. That allows, right, if somebody doesn't have private insurance to link through Trillium, right, complete the eligibility forms, it, it gives you that little bit of time to actually complete all that paperwork uh, and receive this response back. But Aside from that, OHIP, no, uh, but insurance companies will cover, as will the public uh, insurance programs for those who are eligible. Great. Um, there's a question about frequency of testing for serodiscordant couple, couples. Um, do you have it's any comments on, on that? Question, right? Yeah, it says yeah. Viral, viral load measurement, but anyway, I don't know if the person wants to comment on, on that. So this would be elaborate on that. Yeah, this will really be um, dependent on the, the the care provider for the individual living with HIV. This can range from much more frequently to annually, depending on um, how long the person's been using medication, right? Previous labs, so it's quite variable. And this would be something that would be set up between um, the prescribing, like a care provider, and the person living with HIV. Great. Uh, there's a question about uh, if if it is possible for someone experiencing symptoms of HIV infection and still test negative? Yes, uh, the symptoms typically kick in around three weeks. That's where you're going to have the highest sort of frequency uh, of symptoms appearing. At that point, the test is going to be estimated at a population level 65-ish, 70% uh, sensitive. So that means that 30 to 35% of people, approximately one in three, um, would be missed at the time that they are acutely symptomatic. And that's where I said you can rule in, right? So if they do have symptoms and it is tested in the positive, test is positive, right? This is confirming the infection, but you can't rule out, meaning that I can't confidently say it isn't until we hit that six week mark. Okay. And mm, there's a comment about how uh, they find a uh, an individual finds a lot of incidental cases of syphilis in patients who come in primarily for HIV testing. And so if we start testing low risk clients only once every 12 months, is there a concern that we will miss more cases of syphilis this way? Um, so this, I mean, if this is somebody who belongs to a group with higher rates of HIV, uh, so this is a guy who has sex with guys, like any of these groups, it would still be the quarterly testing that would be recommended. Um, if you're noticing a lot of syphilis in other groups, um, right, this, this turns into sort of local epi, and that is not a piece that I mentioned, but if local epidemiology is really saying, right, we are seeing higher rates of HIV within a particular group, right, it would be to include them with the quarterly blood testing as well. And are there new regulations for new immigrants, newly diagnosed from immigration medical or known HIV statuses requiring follow-up? None that I know of, uh, but that, that's not within my area of expertise. Um, okay. And um, so there's a question about how we, can we practically apply the 3P approach to risk stratification when we have minimal information about the partner? Uh, so it's, you don't need to know exactly about the partner, right? It really comes down to, do we know that the person is HIV positive? If so, could the infection be transmissible? Uh, and then if not, right, does the person belong to a group with a higher rate of HIV? 
uh, or not, right? That's really what you need to know about the partner. And that's, that's the stratification process. So is your partner HIV positive? No, uh, or I don't know, right? So then we're saying, okay, we have an, a known or an unknown status. Uh, so the next thing comes into, well, are you in a population that has a higher prevalence of HIV? And that, that's the groups that are listed uh, sort of in prong three. So if a person comes in and says, right, they belong to that group, right? We're automatically up uh, completing that P. And this is based on the P is really what's the potential of exposure that you have. If you say, my sexual partner was just diagnosed with HIV and they've never taken medication, right? That, that's the highest we can possibly get, right? We have a new diagnosis. It is right, likely viremic due to the fact that there, there cannot be a U equals U as the person's not taking medication. That puts us into the highest. How often do I see that? Sometimes, not super frequently. What do I see most of the time? It's somebody who comes in and says, I share drug, some drug equipment. I'm a guy who has sex with guys. Um, I'm a black woman who has sex with uh, men, right? And so that does put within, not to the highest risk, because we don't know that it's a true bona fide uh, potential exposure, but it's the groups with higher prevalence. And so there you have um, your sort of partner, your first P uh, qualified. So you don't need a huge amount of information about the partner. Um, I mean, I work in an STI clinic. I've worked in an STI clinic for uh, 20 years. And really, how often do I know stuff about the partners? Not much. And people are saying, I don't know a lot about them. And it really comes down to even for somebody who is diagnosed with HIV, they say, right, undetectable viral load, but it, it's a confirmed objective status that we're looking at, right? Do you have documented evidence of an undetectable viral load, right? Or is this a subjective report, meaning that it's given to you as information? And that's all built in there to say, are they HIV positive? Yes or no. Do you belong to a group with a higher rate of HIV? Yes or no. And it's really stratifying based on what we can infer uh, and then recommending testing accordingly. Thank you. And uh, what role do you see point of care testing uh, in clinics and what indications would you choose a point of care test over a serology? Serology, I think what we're going to start with is serology is the default. It is a superior technology. It has a shorter window period. Uh, you don't get false um, positives, right? It's just not going to be something that emerges. That doesn't mean the point of care doesn't have a role. An individual with chronic infections, the point of care, right? You're outside of the three months. It's going to be as accurate. Um, somebody where follow-up and the actual linkage and engagement and ability to follow up and find them and give them the diagnosis, the test result, the point of care becomes superior. Um, initiating PEP, right? Doing at the point of care, uh, that test becomes useful as well. So I think we want to go into it saying serology is the better technology as a test but it's not always a better technology for a patient, right? The individual we're interacting with. So if they, right, if the, if the potential exposure is over three months ago, if there's going to be an issue connecting with finding, following up uh, with the person to tell them about, right, the positive test result, or if they have symptoms that are suggestive of chronic infection, the point of care becomes an excellent tool um, in any clinical scenario. Right, thank you. So uh, that will have been our last question. Uh, I know there are some that were, we didn't get to them all. It's obviously a very engaged group today. Uh, so as we wrap up today's PHO rounds, I want to thank Patrick O'Byrne and, and Dr. Austin Zygman for presenting. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Uh, you can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's session. And please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. And lastly, to access past PHO rounds presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events and click on presentations. Uh, thank you all and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.